the culture on i24 news i'm with the groper thank you so much for joining me today on our program we'll talk to irit somer owner of uh, one of israel's top galleries a battle over who has the right to make knafe and we'll take a look back at pop fiction 20 years old this month Let's begin with some uh, cultural headlines. Uh, just a day after we heard they're making a Tetris movie, which uh, made everyone check their calendars to see if it's not April 1st, another multi-billion dollar franchise made a major announcement, Angry Birds. Sony Animation and Rovio revealed the first image from the upcoming animated film and announced a stellar cast of actors and comedians who will voice the volatile fowl. Jason Sudeikis will play the lead character Red, with his sidekicks being played by Danny McBride and Frozen's Josh Gad. Other members of the impressive cast include Peter Dinklage, Maya Rudolph and Bill Hader. The image and cast were revealed on the Angry Birds website after a campaign which required fans to fling a billion birds in the game in just 48 hours. While a movie based on a cell phone game where you throw birds at pigs sounds like a major disaster in the making, we all remember the successful Lego movie. So maybe the birds deserve a chance after all. We'll find out more when it comes out on July 2016. And uh, Netflix is having a very active week in the movie business after announcing they will release the sequel to Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon on their streaming service and in IMAX theaters simultaneously. News has come out that the company signed a four-picture deal with Adam Sandler, the comedian whose past films grossed more than $3 billion worldwide, will produce and star in the upcoming films, while some of uh, Sandler's recent movies, such as Blended and That's My Boy, failed to impress in the box office. The actor is still considered a profitable star in international markets. Netflix is operating in nearly 50 countries and has more than 50 million subscribers worldwide. Let's just hope they're Sandler fans. My guest today is uh, one of the leading gallerists in Israel, representing some of the country's best-known artists. She's also a force in the international scene. We'll soon uh, present her artist's work at two important art fairs, the Fries in London and the FIAC in Paris. I'm very uh, happy to welcome Irit Sommer to the studio. Thanks for coming in, Irit. Thank you. So, um, f uh, first Fries, then FIAC, if yes. I'm not mistaken. Just back to back. Uh, who are you traveling with? Who, who, which <laughs> artists are you taking with you to, to um, see the world? Yes, I uh, <laughs> or, usually or actually have the world see them. Exactly. I have. Um, I usually try and choose uh, like a mixed program of my international and my Israeli artists, and I really like to curate a certain theme and a certain project. And this time on both fairs, Freeze and Fiac, I'm doing something that is related to music and rhythm. And uh, so we have uh, works by Gregor Hildebrand, mm -hmm. a German artist that uh, actually uses the tapes of the music cassettes, uh, an or old archival um, monument, I would even say, and he created a big um, sculpture out of that. He uses um, it as material? As, as material, material, as oh, like nice. gluing it on canvas and building large um, sculptures and uh, works on paper. And here we see just uh, yeah. one of this uh, yeah. sort of big works. They're all made out of uh, music tapes. We Lovely. have uh, works by uh, Saadan Afif, a French uh, artist who does a uh, performance. Um, video works by Yael Bartana, an Israeli artist that also deals a lot with uh, Israeli culture and sort of um, mythical um, ideas. And um, Now, when, when it comes to Israeli art, uh, how, um, what's the status of Israeli art in the world? How is it seen? Well, up to before this summer, I yeah. think uh, the entire art scene, including collectors as well as uh, curators, were very serious and very um, curious about knowing what's happening here in the Israeli art scene. They came to visit. It's a very dynamic art scene with lots of very good and productive artists that are also slowly making it abroad and being mm -hmm. seen abroad. And I think there was a big interest. Now with the, uh, with the war that we have uh, had this summer, I think uh, there will be a it big... Set us uh, back. Definitely, definitely big. Uh, and that's an, uh, that's a recurring uh, problem, I would. That's assume. a recurring problem, unfortunately, every sort of two years. And obviously, the artists and uh, the cultural scene in general are the first one to to feel it and to yeah. hear it. I think uh, we also see it in dance and uh, and in other fields and culture. Yeah, certainly. 
All right, let's uh, leave all that gloomy stuff uh, yeah. <laughs> aside. Let's leave it behind us. I'm curious, when, when you choose an artist to, to represent, yes. how do you do that? Because there are plenty of artists to choose from. There are from. so many, and they all think they're very uh, creative, and they're the next suc most successful artists. And I do believe that that's what they should believe in. Right. And I try first of all to see, you know, if there is a personal sort of uh, engagement of the artist with the art, and really being focused and totally dedicated to this is their and their only career. Mm -hmm. um, this is really important that they have this sort of full commitment. And obviously then I'm, I have to be personally interested by it and to have a good relationship with the artist. I listen to my artist recommendations. I think these are the most accurate and the most, you know, the ones that I always uh, really like to listen to. And the question of uh, sellability or commercialism of, of sort, does that, how, how much, I mean, I'm sure it plays some, some uh, uh, role. It does eventually, I think, in the future. If you have a good artist, and she or he does you know interesting work if it's in uh, video or installation which is less sellable than uh, painting finally at the end of the road if the artist is good and being shown in different in like different museums and biennials it will also yeah. show uh, but it's not just the medium that makes a, a, an artist sellable or less sellable no I, that's just the most easy and the yeah, imminent, imminent uh, but what sorry. else I'm, I'm curious um, well, the artists that really aim to a more broad, uh, broader um, audience, something that is more um, easier to uh, understand and to like, and mm -hmm. more likable works, and others that are more maybe minimal, sophisticated, conceptual, that speak to a very specific and certain audience. Right. Yeah. Well, if we're already talking a little bit about money and, and the business side of, of art, yeah. when you bring international, when you uh, international artists that, that you represent, that you bring to Israel, is it important for them to, to have this uh, this foothold in, in, in Tel Aviv, in Israel? I think they're first of all interested in working here in, in, a, in a scene that they don't know and uh, to work maybe within the Israeli context and to really create work that is related to um, what they think is uh, Israeli. And obviously as an Israeli gallery I invite them and try to first of all place their work within Israeli museums or major sort of collectors, uh, Israeli collectors. And introduce them to, to and the introduce local them to work. the local art. Right. Yes, it's Who otherwise. Who are some of the, the up-and-coming Israeli artists we should uh, keep an eye out for? Um, well, I like two women artists that I have sort of put an eye on. Sorry. One of them okay. is uh, Tamar Harpaz, yeah. a very young artist who's now going to have a residency in uh, Holland at the Rijks Academy. Mm -hmm. And one of them is Nama Arad, who just now graduated uh, at the MFA program in Chicago and now has a residency in New York. Both of them do installations, very uh, ephemeral, actually, um, uh, materials, not commercial, maybe not very uh, <laughs> promising in terms of object, but you see here very grandiose, wow. very monumental works, and museums and uh, international and Israeli museums have already very much engaged with their works. Yeah. Um, now, we've we, we, the last few years have, have been... Um, I don't know, sometimes difficult, sometimes not so. We, in 2008, when the financial uh, crisis uh, occurred, uh, the art market took uh, quite a hit. But uh, after that, it seemed to recover, and more and more. Uh, is there an end to, to, to this? I don't know, is this a bubble? That well, you we, speak that to we're someone a bit more romantic about art, and I don't believe at all in that fi financial look uh, into the art world. I do see that there are a lot of speculations and a lot of big and new money coming in into the art world, which definitely um, boosted if within the very young artists that are being hyped and uh, totally um, sold at very, very high prices, uh, or within the very more established artists that are real sort of market value. Right. Um, that I can do be believe seen also as as, uh, as a big investment. as an investment. Uh, the people see this as a very secure investment versus other investments right. that they're doing. I believe in the in the art, in the power of art, and believe that artists is a, to do art is a marathon and not just a sprint of flipping uh, artwork. It's really about the process. It's about the historical uh, meaning of the artwork. Yeah. Uh, eventually, I think that the collector has to have a, a feeling for the, the piece of art that he's well, buying. So, uh, and I, I would hope so, yes. <laughs> yeah. Irit, uh, thank you so much for coming in, and uh, uh, best of luck and enjoy the, the art fairs. Thank you so much. All right, moving on. Does uh, anyone have cultural rights over food? Is there a wrong way to make a dish? What happens when a Jewish Englishman decides to experiment with a specific Arab dish, the knafe? I-24 News culture correspondent Shachar Pellet went to find out. 
The smell of sweet cheese pastry soaked in sugar-based syrup fills up the nose when entering the small Knafa Noga Cafe in the heart of the city of Jaffa. The ethnic dessert specialty of the Levant is usually found in local Arab stores, but this time Jewish London-born Daniel Phillips decided to make his own version of the Oriental food. So what is an Englishman doing in the middle of Jaffa, Israel, making knafe? I guess it started with a, with a love affair of knafe. Uh, when I came to Israel seven years ago, uh, I met knafe in Daliat Carmel, um, fell in love with it. Immediately, first of all, it was too bizarre, like cheese and sweet. It didn't quite work in my head, but then when I tasted it, it was like, wow, blow me away. And thus far, it's been a stable relationship. Nine months old, his baby has matured into a very special form of the original dish. Traditionally, you have it on big trays, and it can sit there sometimes on the heat, and the cheese changes its te texture. So we changed the whole layout of the way we make knafe. We make personal uh, small trays, which we cook fresh on the spot when people order. Salty knafe, spinach knafe, pistachio knafe, knafe with tomatoes and eggs. This is a style of the ethnic meal that has yet to be seen. Experiments are for people to, to be encouraged to try something else. The, the second bestseller is the halva. People absolutely love it, absolutely love it. We developed our own frozen knafe that you can take home and cook at home. It's, it's developed for the, for the oven, it takes 15, 20 minutes, flip it over, we give you the sauce and the fish stick and you become the knafe chef, basically. But not everyone in Jaffa is pleased. A local activist from the city, which is already considered a sensitive hotspot between Arabs and Jews, drew several hundred likes on a Facebook post condemning what she considers another act of gentrification of the area. Khata Muhammad, a local knafe maker, is also suspicious. This is a product that never changes. The same product for 60 years. In this profession, there's no change. If someone isn't an expert in this profession, he should stay out of it. Green kanafe, kanafe with parsley, how is this possible? But Daniel, an eternal optimistic, believes that there's always room for everyone, and especially for innovation. I just say it's okay to do what I'm doing here because culinary-wise, it's taking a produce that hasn't been developed for some reason anywhere. I'm the first person to do it, and I think it's an amazing project. And now straight from uh, Knafe reporting, it's uh, Shachar Pellen here for her weekly segment, Off Screen. I, I can't see. You must have not eaten <laughs> any of it. I've cause... eaten a lot. <laughs> Too much, in fact. Um, but down with Knafe, um, we're celebrating 20 years now. I'm... It's unbelievable how old we all are. It's, it's awful. <laughs> it's been 20 years since Quentin Tarantino rocked our world with Pulp Fiction, his second directorial uh, feature following Reservoir Dogs. Mm -hmm. Back in 1994, the month of May, was the first ever screening in the Cannes Film Festival, um, where it was a sensation, won the uh, coveted Palme d'Or, the best film in the festival, and it went on to be released in October exactly 20 years ago, um, where it became a worldwide sensation. You know, it was only an $8 million budget and it earned more than $200 million worldwide. It changed everything. It was really a revolution and people really appreciated it. Um, first of all, we can say that it didn't win that year's uh, uh, Grand Oscar, the best uh, film in the Academy Awards. That went to Forrest Gump, uh, uh, um, you know, the mainstream Hollywood yeah. entertainer okay. of that still year. Good. People still were good. still not ready for this. It did went uh, on to win the best screenplay of that mm -hmm. year, but everyone agreed it was a game changer. Yeah. First of all, let's start with the fact that it, it made such a profound influence on a generation of filmmakers. You know, the, it made uh, it was a new film noir style, the non-linear story structure, the uh, uh, cartoon violence, you know, getting yeah. shot uh, as you're in the toilet or uh, mistakenly his, in the back of the seat. The yeah. Exactly. This suddenly was Marvel. hilarious. Um, the pop culture dialogues, uh, who would have thought that uh, a cheeseburger conversation uh, about how cheeseburgers <laughs> are in the Netherlands would be so fascinating. It, it really changed everything and its legacy is still seen up until today and, and years later films really tried to copy it. We've seen Get Shorty and, and mm -hmm. Lockstock and Snatch and uh, um, Go and even Sin City where uh, uh, Tarantino himself actually directed one of the scenes. Mm -hmm. Everything is really built on this uh, on this 
masterpiece uh, back in the uh, it is a mid masterpiece. 90s. There's no question about it. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my mouth shut for most of this because I wouldn't, I couldn't hold back and I would just quote <laughs> the whole movie out we for you. But I remember it. watching it at the Haifa Film Festival when I was 16 and it blew my it mind. It blew everyone's mind. It was, mind. It was just... something out of this world. And it not only put the spotlight on Tarantino, but also it brought back to life uh, John Travolta from his days of mm -hmm. Greece and put finally the spotlight on Uma Thurman, on Bruce Willis, on Samuel L. Jackson. These major, major Hollywood stars can say thank you to this film, and so can we. Here's a few anecdotes you might have not known about this film. Tarantino began writing the screenplay in Amsterdam. That's why the influence is on Dutch. And one more anecdote. Julia Lewis-Dreyfus was supposed to be Mia Wallace. What a different wow. Mia Wallace With that would that have been. With that bombshell, we're uh, finishing for today. Thank you, Shachal. Thank, thank you. you at home uh, for joining us as well. Please join us again next week.